So hello, everybody. Uh, I think uh, it's safe to start now. Uh, we we'll let people join in. I hope those of you who joined already have taken the poll. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, evening, or may I just say greetings to, to all of you uh, because we have people from all over the world today. I uh, hope you're all very well. I'm Palvashe from Community World Service Asia, based here in Lahore, Pakistan. Uh, some of you may already be familiar with us, uh, but for those who aren't, uh, Community World Service Asia is a national um, humanitarian and development organization. We're headquartered in Pakistan and implementing initiatives all around the Asia region. We are a member of the CHS Alliance and the SPARE country uh, focal point in Pakistan. We're also SPARE's region partner in Asia. So uh, this webinar is hosted uh, by the Asian Disaster Risk Reduction Network's Quality and Accountability Thematic Hub, which is hosted by Community World Service Asia. So, so the focus of the hub is to strengthen uh, principled humanitarian action in the region through promoting, um, through promoting approaches, um, Q and A standards, and approaches and principles among ADRN members. Um, and the hub is organizing webinars and panel discussions around different themes on Q&A uh, during the 2020 regional partnership events that are co-hosted uh, by ADRN, ICWA, uh, UN ACHA, and Community World Service Asia. These events are a series of consultations and webinars uh, that will bring key humanitarian actors and other relevant stakeholders together for focused discussions and perspective sharing on how disaster risk reduction, emergency preparedness, and humanitarian response should transform in this changing context. Um, coming to, to the topic today, which is safeguarding, um, it is a serious issue and um, it requires a lot of investment in terms of time, energy and resources to effectively mainstream it. Um, it is a core component of our shared commitment to accountability towards affected uh, populations. Uh, now, as an organization, um, as an organization, uh, we've been working with Esther, um, who I'm going to introduce in a bit, for some time now on not only mainstreaming um, complaints response mechanism, but also ensuring safeguarding of the communities we work with in the region to ensure accountabilities uh, to the communities we serve. Uh, today, we also, um, I, we, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to reach out to our partners and ADRN members who may need support on mainstreaming safeguarding and invite them to approach us if they need any support in this context. And we will provide whatever support we can in our capacity to strengthen systems, policies, and human resource skills to address issues regarding safeguarding and other uh, quality and accountability standards. So please feel free to contact us after this session if you need um, any support in this aspect. Um, as I mentioned, uh, before any further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our facilitator and uh, our moderator for this webinar, uh, Esther Dross. Um, I'm sure many of you might already know of her. Uh, she is an independent consultant with over 25 years of experience specializing in accountability, prevention of sexual uh, exploitation and abuse, uh, gender and child protection. So uh, she has a very interesting uh, session lined up for you, which I'm sure you'll all enjoy. Uh, now, before we start the main session, uh, we just want to mention a few housekeeping aspects. Um, I think, um, yeah, so you can see uh, the rules on screen here. So today's webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes. Uh, all the videos and mics have been turned off by default to avoid any background noise, except for speakers, of course. Um, and if connectivity allows, we will try to use the video feature as much as possible. So, you know, you can see us and there's more connectivity. Uh, you can all chat with us and each other and leave comments in the comment box. Um, you can see the comment box there. Uh, we will take questions that are posted in the question box. So please post your questions in it during the webinar. However, due to the size of the group and time limitation, we won't be able to take live questions um, via audio. So uh, that, 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 that's unfortunate, but uh, please feel free to drop in your questions. Uh, we will be running two polls during the webinar to assess your opinion on certain aspect. I think one we've already done, one we'll do later on. So, so please um, do take part in those. Um, 
another yeah so this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website um the community world service asia website for others to listen to and should any of you have any concerns or complaints about the webinar or us uh, please feel free to use the complaints respond mechanism of uh, community world service asia the details are posted on the slide and um, on our website so um i think i will hand over the floor to esther now Thank you, uh, thank you very much um, for You're this welcome. introduction and welcome to all, to everybody in the room. I can say we're over 100 participants, so welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. For us here, it's uh, good morning. It's still very dark outside. Good. Um, over the last couple of months, since we've all gone remotely, there have been a couple of conferences and webinars on the topics of safeguarding, prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, complaints and response mechanism, accountability. What we want to do today, after a quick overview of what we mean by safeguarding and safeguarding framework, we would like to look at safeguarding from a bit of different angle and really um, put more weight on the P of prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. So we would like to speak a little bit more about community engagement and how we can give out messages around sexual exploitation and abuse and prevention of these issues. I will listen to Smruti Patel. Welcome Smruti and thank you already. We'd also like to look at the at prevention from the angle of investigations and how robust investigations can or should contribute to prevent and be a deterrent for sexual exploitation and abuse and we'll welcome Shell from uh, Norwegian Jurated. Welcome, good morning, Shell, already, and thank you for participating. And we'd also touch quickly upon how references, vetting, and the misconduct um, disclosure scheme uh, can contribute to more prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. So please, this should be as interactive as possible. It's not just about me uh, telling you and presenting something, but please be active, uh, give us your thoughts on the chat. Uh, ask questions, we'll address them as much as possible. And if we cannot address them here, we'll address them uh, later in a, in a Q&A document from, um, as a feedback from this, um, this seminar, from this webinar. So maybe, and I will just want to start with uh, some interactive question and please um, give us your opinion on the chat. If you can move the slides, um, uh, hold on to the next one. So when we talk about safeguarding, what are we actually talking about? Can you please use the chat and tell tell us what you understand by safeguarding? What we mean by safeguarding? You, any 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 opinion? Any contribution on the chat? If you have to define what we mean by a safeguarding framework, what is this we talk about? This is a very silent group. Good. Protecting communities with surfing and making sure that they're not worth off in any way because of our work. Keeping people safe. Protection of all. And somebody, how can we save ourselves from harm? Thank you protect the community, promoting the welfare of children, protection of staff and community, and protecting vulnerable segments from all type of abusing. Measure that ensure safety pre, during, and after our work. Keeping all safe, do no harm. Great, thanks a lot. Um, I really, I really like the do no harm. Is is that not what resumes so well? What we should be doing all the time. Thanks a lot for, for that one. Creating a safe environment, empower communities to raise their voice. Yes, so that is about complaints, response mechanism, isn't it? How we can enable communities that they can tell us when things go wrong. Good, excellent. Thanks a lot for this. Can um, maybe can you move to the next slide? 
maybe to uh, just resume everything you've just said. So yes, yeah, safeguarding is a set of policies, a set of practices and procedures which an organization must have to protect children, but also vulnerable adults from the harm the organization itself represents for the people it's in contact with, it works with, or it works for. We often have programs to, um, you can remain on the one before, uh, Huram, please. We, we often have programs to protect people from harm. So from consequences of natural disaster, from impact of conflict, from displacement, being a refugee, being a migrant, many situations where we need protection. However, when we talk about safeguarding measures, these are meant to protect children and vulnerable adults from the harm we ourselves will represent to people we are meant to protect and work with. So this is safeguarding is much wider than protection. It aims to ensure that the organization itself is safe for people who are interacting with the organization and that there is no negative impact of the work of the organization to the people. Just to remind ourselves that anybody of us can be vulnerable and adults vulnerable in our lives. Uh, clearly there are some permanent vulnerabilities like uh, being handicapped, being part of a minority, in some cases maybe being a woman, being a child. But all of us can become vulnerable adults due to a natural disaster, due to a conflict in our countries, simply because we lose our jobs, because we're affected nowadays by the COVID-19 crisis, because we lose family support. And it's important to take that into account. This helps us sometimes to remember that we can be part of the vulnerable group to try to imagine how we would feel if we were part of this group and what are we expecting from the organization who will be supporting us. So um, we can move to the next one. A safeguarding framework is all that set of policies which will protect us. So starting with the code of conduct, going to a safeguarding policy, a child safeguarding policy, but also maybe your HR manual, your standard operating procedures, um, child safeguarding procedures, anything which rules and regulates the work we do. A complaints and response mechanism, of course, is also part of this, this framework. And, and we'll talk more about specifically complaints and response mechanism on the webinar in about 10 days on, on that subject. But it's an important, um, component of, of the framework. Let me give you, if we can move to the next one, let me give you some figures on, on we have from 1919, uh, 1919, 2019, of course, uh, 21st century, sorry. The UN has been reporting in 2019, 99 cases in, uh, involving 118 survivors and UN partners have been reporting 174 cases. So clearly when you think about the number of organizations we are, the number of staff we represent and the number of beneficiaries and communities we, we work with and for, these numbers seem to be quite low, which doesn't necessarily mean we do very well in safeguarding, but it pretty shows how, how much under-reporting we still have when it comes to cases of sexual exploitation and abuse. We still have hide barriers for people to come and reach out to us. We still have very little knowledge on what we mean by sexual exploitation and abuse so that people actually can identify those cases and report it to us. What we know, for example, on children is that one boy out of six has been abused before he reaches the age of 18. One girl out of four uh, has been abused before reaching the age of 18. So that is a lot of people and um, not reported all the time. Abuse can happen everywhere in our home, in our workplace, in our environment, in a community, in a church, in a public place, in a refugee camp, in many different settlements, rural areas, cities. And in most of the cases, exploitation and abuse happens from a person who is not a stranger to the vulnerable adult or to the child. Very often involves somebody we know and involves a degree of manipulation and grooming uh, from the alleged perpetrator. 
So when we talk about safeguarding, we talk about this whole set of policies and practices we've set in place, and we hope will safeguard people from this harm our organization can bring to them. I want to show you, uh, somebody is asking what is the core difference between safeguarding and protection. So that is really the core difference. Safeguarding is much wider. This is not uh, about physically maybe standing in front of those children and protect them, but it's about the, set, the whole framework, the set of rules we're setting ourselves um, so that we can create a situation, can create an environment where abuse and exploitation cannot happen or can at least happen less. I want to show you a, a small movie. We realize very often that exploitation, abuse and har harassment happen because of power differentials. So let me show you a, a short movie on that subject. Can you, um, Kuram, can you play the movie for us, please? Yes, sister, we are going to show the movie. Thank you.
thank you, uh, thank you, Huram, for for this. So that's a, that was a very short movie from the Interagency Standing Committee, uh, as the as a, um, awareness raising uh, material to speak about prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse, but also to make a very clear link to power. So as we can see, when we talk about uh, safeguarding measures, we need to acknowledge that most of sexual exploitation and abuse has as an underlying reason the power differential between humanitarian workers and the people we work with or we work for. Maybe you can move to the next slide, um, Huram. Those power imbalances bring us to accountability. The shortest definition of accountability is the responsible use of power. So power and how each of us uses one's own power responsibly is so incredibly important when we talk about sexual exploitation and abuse and trying to equilibrate those power differentials so that we can better prevent situations where vulnerable adults and children are exploited or abused simply because they are in need to survive and they are on, a, on, a, on not such a favorable power situation. These power differentials are the main reason why some people are able to exploit others. And when we talk, talk either of exploitation or we talk about abuse or we talk about harassment, when we go to the core of the reasons, we always get to power and power differentials. Uh, the recent example in uh, DRC, the recent example on uh, allegations of having been sexually abused during the Ebola response are a typical example of how the power represented by humanitarian workers was misused towards very vulnerable populations, uh, women in this specific case, who were desperate for work and therefore ready to exchange sex for any promise of work, any salary increase or continuation of the work contract. So altogether, safeguarding is really about how we ch change those power dynamics, how we change our organizational culture into a more open a more equilibrated, a more inclusive and a more diverse workspace where different voices can not only be heard, but they really lead to, uh, they really lead to, to changes. It also means that communities need to be better integrated and taken into account when we define our safeguarding strategies. What information do we need to share with these communities? And we'll listen to uh, Smoothie just in a short while a bit more about this. What would they like to know about our policies, our staff, our commitments? How would they feel comfortable to complain? And what is their expectation when they are raising a concern? This is also important as um, through our strategies and policies we have in place, we very often raise expectations and some of these might not be realistic. Uh, Shell will speak more about investigations uh, just a bit later, but raising a complaint does not necessarily mean that the investigation will be able to uphold the allegations because we'll still need to collect sufficient evidence to confirm misconduct. So having this dialogue with communities, not only on our commitments, but also on their expectations, on the limits of what we can do, on the procedures we have in place and how this practically works, helps to manage community expectation, but it will also improve our mutual understanding on the complexity of those issues. We'd really like to see that picture with the elephant and the mouse in a more um, balanced way. Can you move to the next um, to the next uh, slide, please, Huram? Thank you. So power dynamics, power balances, imbalances are really linked to wealth, to knowledge, to independence, privilege, economical status, social status, and also the ability to set values and norms. It's not easy to change quickly some of these factors. However, the knowledge, the access to information, how we share information, how we share knowledge contributes to give more power because knowledge is power. So share, sharing better information, sharing more knowledge are key and are, essential uh, are an essential basis to equilibrate power and help communities to be 
fully integrated in this accountability cycle to prevent exploitation and abuse. It's also probably one of the easiest factors we have and upon which we can have influence. We might not be able to change wealth and status and privilege so quickly, but we can definitely um, improve a lot on how we share knowledge and information. So sharing knowledge and information on sex exploitation and abuse, this is also explaining in plain and simple language as exclusive and diverse as possible what we mean by exploitation and abuse. So that concretely means that we need to take into account numerous languages we speak, the right of traditions we have, number of different cultures and origins we work in and we work for. So this needs to be communication on, se on sexual exploitation and abuse needs to be much wider than repeating the core commitments to staff and communities. We need to engage into dialogue. We need to explain in simple language what all those different definitions mean, what we mean by safeguarding uh, to start with. We need to think through different communication tools, use technology when it's appropriate, but also think about different environments where maybe the tradition is more verbal where maybe uh, populations, communities are illiterate. So we cannot use a written communication. There are some great examples in West Africa where we use theater programs to disseminate uh, messages on sexual exploitation and abuse. In some refugee camps, expected behavior is explained regularly through radio programs, again, in simple languages, Palestine, there are great examples of organizations reaching out to young program participants through acting courses and improvisation games to talk about child abuse and exploitation. And another interesting example is the organization Green String, uh, again in East Africa, which is working with storytelling and drama groups to talk about definitions and understandings of situations linked to sexual exploitation and abuse, and we can share uh, their website later. I would like now to turn to Smuti Patel, who is the executive director of the Global Mentoring Initiative in here in Geneva, to talk to us more about how this initiative supports partners and communities in, um, in regards to safeguarding and prevention aspects. Thank you, Smuti. Thank you, Esther, and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> uh, well, here it's morning. Um, uh, thank you for giving this opportunity to share some of the experiences. Um, so as Esther said, I'm um, Director of a Global Mentoring Initiative, and uh, I work with partners uh, from different parts of the world to develop a culture of safeguarding. And so I wanted to share some experiences with you on that. But I want to start my journey um, when I first became an aid worker in 1995 was my first mission in, in part of Asia. And that, um, Esther, that uh, video you just showed uh, was, is really powerful because I remember being on the other side of it, basically being an aid worker and seeing child abuse happening and not knowing where to go who to, who to contact, how to deal with that situation. And that heartbeat that I heard was my heartbeat because I could see the harm that was being, being done, but I had no idea what to do, how to approach. And when I did approach, um, nothing really happened. So in a way, this is kind of a circle when I see this, uh, this video. Um, so my work actually um, is really with working with partners to really think about um, safeguarding holistically. And I remember that thing about not knowing where to go, right? And that uh, for me it has become a quest in a way of how do we create a culture inside the organization and outside? Because I think unless we start inside with the staff, uh, you cannot permeate that culture outside of safeguarding. Uh, so one of the first thing I do with, uh, with partners is sit together with the senior management um, and start talking about the values. And um, through the, that discussion, 
uh, we also start talking about, okay, what are the some sets of codes of conduct that you have for your staff that everybody knows about them? Uh, and so try and, and try and then ask them to map what are all the different communication channels? So this is all the internal work that first needs to happen to raise awareness, even of your staff, of what is your code of conduct and how will you communicate that to the community? So for the first step is really to map the different communication channels. So for example, I'll give you an example from my work in Myanmar. Um, so some of the channels they talked about was the regular meetings that staff have at project level, which is um, either every, every week or all staff meeting, which may be every month, or they have um, every quarterly meeting on, on specific issues or there's trainings happening. So what we try to do is get them to say, okay, these are opportunities for communicating on your code of conduct, reminding people, and then producing messages. And again, um, we, we created a small group of people within the organization to look at how do you communicate these messages outward? What are some of the ways of doing that? Um, so that kind of created this buy-in from the staff and also the, the, the senior management. And buy-in from the senior management is absolutely key because you need resources, uh, meaning human resources, right? And a commitment that this is really important to the organization. So that was the first um, step. The second step was really accompanying them to the communities because um, when we had this conversation, it very transpired very quickly that people didn't feel very comfortable of how they bring this topic up in the community because we are there to help them and that they want to uh, give this idea that we may be harming them. So there was the whole um, kind of uh, training with the, the staff to say how do you how do you bring this to the community and what I really encourage them is really talking about the values um, as part of the code of conduct you know in terms of transferring the co code of conduct to the, to the to the communities but what we first did is we did a mapping of who are the different communities you work with and what kind of communica communication channels you use at the moment in terms of your programming. Um, and we looked at those channels and so what kind of key messages can you uh, provide through those channels? So just give you an example. So the programming coordinator, for example, said, ah, we can look at each of the program that we're running and we communicate messages about what the program is about, um, the timelines and all of those things. So we will also include there um, the, the key messages um, around um, the types of behavior that's expected from our staff in, in being with the community and where could they go if there is a problem. So, um, so there was a bit of a holistic approach. We did the same with all the other divisions in the, in the organization. Then we moved actually to the community. So then I uh, worked with them to map who in the community um, are actually working on safeguarding the, the, the broader aspects. So for example, um, in, uh, in the communities we visited, there are child protection focal points that's already there. Uh, there are others who are working on uh, women's issues. Uh, there are others who are working on uh, other safeguarding issues, uh, gender-based violence, etc. So what we did is we went to those um, organizations as well and said, we want to make sure we get these key messages out to the community and also set up a mechanism where people are able to come to us if there are any issues through different channels. So um, taking that holistic approach uh, ensured that we also got some um, feedback from there, how to provide some of these uh, key messages because they know the community best. They have, doing, they have been doing child protection and other work in the community. So they also know contextually how the messages can be given. 
and how to engage the community because this is not easy how to engage community especially where there are myths i think i saw one of the comments in the chat box where there are myths and also um, there is there are legal issues where they they may not be able to come uh, come to to book and we want to make sure that we protect uh, we take the right measures to protect right so we did this holistic approach um, to make sure that you know we engage people on the ground, uh, people who are really dealing with safeguarding issues, to get their collective wisdom to to make the right kind of communication, um, and then they came back with all that information inside, and then they started drafting the messages. Of course, uh, the the key um, I would say the key inspiration are the six key messages from uh, from the ISC. We know. Uh, what those are, and um, Esther kind of um, uh, started with that earlier. So really around, you know, not um, th this power abuse, the exchange of money. So all the key messages, um, we, we started crafting them in a way that were appropriate to the cultural context. Um, and then they started uh, um, with the staff first, right? So firstly, it's the staff who created the messages, and they also created a symbol, uh, which uh, which was appropriate for their context as well, which helped them to remind them about the, the you know um, the PSEA messages. And then they took that and piloted that in a community, two communities actually, to see how those messages are being received, any feedback from whether whether they understand the messages, um, and then to to revise them in, um, uh, as appropriate. So these were some of the key steps that we, we took. Um, and um, now they are in the stage of really rolling this out at a, at a larger level in, in different projects and programs. So, you know, it's a really a systematic approach. I would say we focus too much on policies and procedures and not enough on creating the culture uh, of accountability and of, of uh, safeguarding. So my focus has really been on how do you raise awareness? How do people really know what um, PSA is about and feel it, right? Um, and, and take that to the community and make sure that you um, connect with the people in the community who have that capacity to help you. Right? It's not a, not a job on your own. It must be done in a collaborative way because this is the only way we are going to succeed on this. Uh, so that's really my kind of key messages is making sure, firstly, you work internally, map out where are the different communication channels. There are hundreds, you know, there are so many communication channels you already have. Use every one of them and make sure that you come out with the key messages that are really appropriate. Because sometimes what I've seen in other places is they're cutting and pasting messages from their, um, either from the partner, their donor partner, or from, from somewhere else, and then people are not understanding them. So I think these are some of the key things and making sure that all of the, um, all of the communities understand what that is, right? Um, that it's appropriate to women, men, girls, boys. So you really make appropriate messages. And that, that was some other work we did. So Esther, this thing about safeguarding and, and children's rights, for example, right? Um, so we went to um, child rights organizations and, and uh, people who were working on in this locality and asked them, how do you do some of the key messages? How can we integrate some of these key messages in, in the messaging that you are doing as well and, and uh, create the, the synergy? So um, I would say working collaboratively with, with others is really important, but internal uh, culture and understanding is really, really key. Some of the work we did around internal um, work was really around how are the power balances inside the organization? Because if there is power imbalance inside the organization and people feel re retaliation or they don't feel comfortable to bring up issues, because often it's the other staff who may notice this, then it doesn't go very far. So internal messaging is as important as external messages. So we did a lot of work around staff awareness um, and also the internal culture before we started going out. Um, I will stop at that. And uh, please, if you have any questions, 
um, let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking me for the next hour. I think it's a good experience and share. Thanks a lot. So clearly, um, and thanks for reminding us, it's usually very uh, helpful to link whatever we want to achieve in the community in within our own stuff to our values. And we all have very similar values. If, if we are from South America or from Asia or from Africa, whatever, Europe, we have very similar values. And it's always a good exercise to remind actually starting with the stuff and then going out to communities, what are the values we talk about? So we can tackle safeguarding from a I think from a more positive side than when we come with the prohibitions. When we say this and this is prohibited, because then it, it sounds like we do that all the time, which is really not the case. We know that most of the people we work with and for do behave appropriately. Um, so to take it from the positive side, to remind ourselves, these are the values we've signed up. This is what we committed to, and that's what we're here to do. Uh, being it for supporting children, being it for supporting communities, women, whatever is our specific aim and specific program. But the reminders of these values is for me the basis. Then when we then we take it from there and we start speaking more about maybe also the prohibitions. And for people, for communities to be able to tell us when uh, communities, and I should really include staff as well, as you were very, very well mentioning, that's what we see often. Staff do not report on worrying situations because they feel such a high barrier on retaliation, on how it's perceived, on how uh, other people will react and being threatened that even ourselves, we are hesitant sometimes to report on a worrying situation we observe because we, we are fearful of losing our jobs or uh, friendships, sometimes many reasons for these barriers. So reminding first staff and then communities of what we mean by these different prohibitions and not just copy and paste the six core commitments, which we all start to know very well, but do we know them so well? You know, how much do we all know of what we mean by what is sexual exploitation? I could start a whole half an hour discussion with all of you to say, what do you, what do you understand by this? What, what is this for you? Um, so think through what that actually practically means in the community when we say these prohibitions is, is much more helpful than just repeating the core commitments all the time. And that's a, that's a lot of, uh, of course, contextualized work. And, and it, it really means to engage the communities, listen to the voices from the communities, ask them how they understand these prohibitions, how they understand these commitments, how they word them, what happens in the community, what is their biggest issue in terms of behavior so that we can come to a, a nice uh, information campaign. And rem remember when I told you, for me, knowledge is the key of power. And when we share knowledge with communities and we share knowledge with staff at every level, we do share power because it makes people more knowledgeable about their rights. And I think one of the basic knowledge we need to remind people of that they have a right to complain and that is key to safeguarding. If we all know that there is a complaint system and that we can be complained about and that there will be, and Jill will just talk about this now, there will be an investigation and there will be some disciplinary action, we will change our behavior more than if we think that nobody watches what we do and we can just get away with just about everything. So thank you very, very much for this. Yes? Just, just a quick one. Um, so one of the key things that we did through having that dialogue with the community is build trust, right? Mm -hmm. Really, that, that is really at the base of all this because if you, it's the pillar. If you don't build trust in the community um, by having these discussions honestly and openly, I think that they'll be very reluctant, even if you have a system to actually come to you. And by um, having this wide discussion with other stakeholders who are also working on safeguarding, I think that creates that trust and, and interaction uh, and, and I think collaboration that's necessary to, to take this forward. Um, so I would say building trust in your staff and then building trust in the community on this and, and, um, and then acting, right? <laughs> because yeah. it's 
no good having that thing and nobody's acting on the complaints.com. Um, and that's where you show the trust, right? That, the, that they can trust you. And, and I'm going back to my, my first mission and these heartbeats, right? Nobody acted on what I had said. And it was really distressful for me as, as somebody who witnessed something, but also obviously for the children who, who were affected. So I think that is absolutely key. You, to, to maintain trust, you need to make sure you act. I'm sure that's very nicely for the next session. Yes, thank you very much, Smoothie. I, I couldn't have introduced that better than you. So yes, so this is about acting. Um, it's not just about preventing and talking about what are our values, but if then things happen, we need to be acting and we need to be also seen as acting, I think. So this is all about reporting back. Again, to prevent, there needs to be also some kind of deterrent so that we can see there is a police officer who will tell us to stop when we misbehave and there will be a sanction if if this is substantiated. We will now, I want to, I turn to Shell from the Norwegian Church Ed and Shell is um, extremely knowledgeable and experienced in investigation so he will talk to us more about investigations and how this can work as a, a prevention tool for uh, sex exploitation and abuse and that actually also fits into one of the questions we've just I, i've just seen a question asking what are the core principles of conducting psc investigations so please shall you have the the microphone thank you very much uh, esther um and uh, uh yeah my name is uh, shell magne and i work for norwegian church aid um I have prepared a small presentation, but I can do it. I will do it orally. That's uh, that's very fine. Uh, I keep them as my notes, and I'm very happy to to have the the panelists before me because uh, the, my presentation fills in and um, uh, builds on what they have already said. So, thank you for that. Um, I want well, I want you to think back to the, the video uh, that was shown. What if you are a survivor of sexual exploitation and abuse? What do you do? Um, most of you would say uh, you, will not you will not do anything. And that could be a, a several, several reasons for that. And we have slightly touched upon uh, barriers for this. So I'm not going to go into depth on, on barriers. But what my uh, previous presenter said, that you, uh, you need to know uh, what, you, uh, what uh, the expected behavior of uh, the people that work with you. Uh, and you should know how to be able to report it. So that's, that's key. And statistically, uh, I'm very sorry to say that very few, well, not enough. Um, I don't have the exact statistics, but we know that many people don't report it. And if they do report it, they have expectations as we have touched upon already. And I also uh, appreciate what you said just now that trust is the key. Uh, I like to to say uh, you have to walk the talk, and when the when it comes to investigations, um, you kind of have to follow the procedures. Although I I uh, like what you have already said, it has to be a culture, it has to be built into your system. Uh, you don't you shouldn't have to rely on the document at all times. But when you do an investigation, you have to refer to documents, you have to refer to policies. And so you need to have those policies uh, in place. Um, and to build trust takes a long time. Trust is not something you are given on the first day uh, you work. You have to earn trust. It could take years to build trust, and it only takes a day to, to take it down again. So you 
really have to be careful uh, and you have to be structured and work and build up this trust. So you have to fit, design a system that fit, actually fits your system or fits the context you're working. And it's crucial that you follow your procedures. Um, you also mentioned uh, briefly that you shouldn't make promises that you can't keep. And I, I would like to stress that a lot. If you make promises and you can't keep them, the trust is torn down very quickly. And you, in, you, in the complaints mechanisms, you, you promise confidentiality. If you breach the confidentiality principle, you lose the trust. So keep the confidentiality. You should be honest and transparent. There are certain limits in investigations um, that you can't do, uh, especially now in COVID-19 uh, situation. Be honest about those limitations so that the people you work with have the right expectations. Otherwise, they, this will also damage your trust. And uh, as important, you should treat everyone with dignity and respect. Uh, it's easy for me as an investigator, um, when I receive a complaint, uh, I see it in my inbox uh, and I read through it and I say, oh, okay, this is, this is not that serious because I have had more serious cases. But that's extremely dangerous thought. For the person that file a complaint, it's deadly serious. And you have to treat the, the complaint as deadly serious. You can't differentiate uh, the complaints between each other. You have to treat them with dignity and respect. And that's, uh, that's very important. In NCA, um, I, I have been in this position for uh, a bit more than a year, since uh, August uh, 2019. In, in summer 2019, uh, our main back donors, which is the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the state funding called uh, NORAD, uh, they represent about 40% of our income. So they are a big, big donor. We really rely on them. They told us that they don't have trust in our system. And that uh, by then the alarm bells went off uh, by the NCA management. We, before that, we were very happy about the system we had in place and we were proud to um, to report to our back donors that we had uh, a, one SEA case uh, on an annual basis uh, which we treated well uh, and we also had five six seven corruption cases which we treated and we were very happy with that and we got positive feedback with that but when our back donors checked our system they found it very difficult to understand and a huge barrier to actually file a complaint. So they, they were actually very strict to us. They said, you have to revise your complaint mechanism. You have to lower the barrier for the communities to file a complaint. And we want to see more cases. Statistically, we're, in the countries we work, there are far more cases than what we can document. And there are no reasons to believe that NCA is better uh, than other organizations. So we suspect that we have more cases that are not reported. We did a very quick uh, uh, change in the system. We lower the barrier uh, and by lower the barrier, um, I mean that we, we made well, the previous system, we had four different channels to complain and the complainant had to analyze what kind of complaints, which channel to use. That is taken away. We now have one channel for every single complaint you have, one channel. And this complaint comes to me and a team of two others. We do the analysis of the complaint and treat it uh, according to, um, 
to the relevant uh, uh, procedures. And we also accepted anonymous complaints. Uh, not all organizations do that, but we decided we want to try that. And immediately we saw effect of this uh, change. Uh, from January to uh, August, uh, we received 12 complaints. Uh, from September to December, we received 22 complaints. So we, we doubled uh, the complaints in, in one quarter. And since January 2020, we have an average of 20, uh, between 20 and 25 complaints per quarter, so per three months. So up till now, in 2020, uh, I have handled 78 complaints on all aspects. Uh, and among those 78, we now have 40 uh, complaints on corruption. We have 10 complaints on sexual exploitation and abuse. We have three uh, on harassment. We have one uh, of a suspected breach of national laws. And we have what we call uh, other category, 24 complaints in the other category. Other uh, category is and not something that we start investigations on. That could be a complaint from um, a, a private donor in Norway decided to, well, because of a political campaign we had in Norway, they don't want to fund us anymore, give us any money. And that's not something we need to investigate. We have uh, some of the experiences we, uh, we have from um, from this, this change, is that one of the country offices, they filed an SCA complaint. This is an SCA complaint between two staff members. We treated that complaint, we handled it, and we found it uh, um, uphold. Uh, we, it, there were reasonable doubt, we have evidence to confirm that the incident that uh, was alleged happened, actually happened. And the alleged perpetrator confessed everything and said that, well, uh, well, uh, yes, he knew it was a breach of the code of conduct, but he knew that all uh, in his uh, country, uh, all, other, all other organizations do the same. It's, it's okay and no one does anything to, to stop it. So uh, the expats, they talk, uh, talk about it at the pubs, uh, they 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 brag about it. They they say how many uh, how many women they uh, they have, etc. So it's a, it was accepted, and no one did anything about it. After this person was dismissed, we uh, received within two following months. We received five more SEA cases on the same country office uh, with the same topic. Uh, and uh, internal SCA cases. Um, so this to us shows that by doing a, a, a proper investigation and we could demonstrate a reaction to the alleged perpetrator when we have enough evidence, we managed to build trust in that country office. Uh, and we also managed to see that, okay, it's not, okay to treat uh, our colleagues in this way. We actually have to stop. Three of the five were dismissed. The two of them were given a written warning. So all of them were found uh, guilty, so to speak. We have also a different experience, um, which, is, uh, which relates to the confidentiality part of investigations which is challenging because we, we also received an SEA complaint uh, in a country office. Um, the complainant was a secondhand uh, witness. So this was uh, something uh, she had heard. Uh, it was alleged breach of the code of conduct. So she felt she had to uh, file a complaint. We started an investigation and we found, uh, the, we found evidence and we treated it uh, accordingly. 
and the perpetrator was uh, also dismissed. What we did know was that this a rumor that this complainant filed was a rumor that everyone knew about. So when we, according to our policies, when we conduct an investigation and we have a conclusion, we only inform the complainants, uh, the survivor, if it's different from the complainant and the subject of the com complaints. We didn't inform the rest of the country office because uh, they, according to our um, policies, they are not uh, entitled uh, to, to know this information. And we didn't know that they knew about these rumors. Uh, and I had to correct myself a little bit because in this case, the person was not dismissed. So that's, and that's the background here because the people, the, the remaining staff that knew about the rumor, they were convinced that there were truth in this rumor. We found it uh, not, we did not find evidence in this case. Uh, but with no actions, the staff uh, reacted in a way that they said, well, nothing is happening. So we actually contributed establishing a culture where it was acceptable to treat fellow staff members in this way. Um, so this is, it's extremely tricky. It's very difficult to conduct uh, SEA investigations. Uh, and um, I have now, well, the, the, the last, uh, where are we now? We are in November. So the last 11 months uh, I've been part of uh, 15 investigations um, and it's extremely time consuming. It's extremely difficult and we rely on evidence. Um, and in internal matters or if um, when a perpetrator is uh, filing a complaint, it's very rarely solid evidence. And that's, that's a headache to us as investigators. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I should elaborate more on that, but uh, I think my conclusion, uh, I, I am, my statement is that if you develop robust complaint mechanisms, that's uh, a prerequisite. And if you conduct robust investigations, you walk the talk, then you build trust among your staff, your local communities and your stakeholders. And this way you can demonstrate that the perpetrators are sanctioned and hence you contribute to prevent sexual exploitation and abuse. I think it's important that you demonstrate uh, that actions is taken so that people trust your system. If they don't trust your system, they will not file a complaint. I think I'll leave it with that. That's my short uh, 10 minutes uh, or so, or probably more. So if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shell. I was muted. Thanks a lot. Very interesting and some very important points. So thank you for sharing these. I do, I do take from you that the robust investigations are part of a robust complaints system, and we can only have change of organizational culture if we walk the talk and if one can see that when a complaint comes up, it's looked into. And we both know that it's not always substantiated, which doesn't mean it didn't happen as we all know, all of us who do investigations, a complaint cannot be substantiated simply because there is no evidence. And it's important to remind ourselves that complaints handling is also about being a fair and independent process. And everybody has rights uh, in that process, the, the alleged perpetrator actually as, as well. So if we cannot substantiate a complaint, well, then uh, that's, that's how it is. Can be very frustrating, but it can also be that nothing has happened. But if people see that we do that, and if we do reply, and if we do communicate about, about um, 
investigations and results and what you just did, uh, Shell, was very interesting how many complaints you've received on what, how you dealt with them without breaching confidentiality. But if we become better in reporting back publicly on the number of complaints we receive, we deal with, which region they happen may be, what kind of complaints it is. Is it about harassment? Is it about exploitation? Is it about children? Or is it about operational complaints, corruption, or anything else? It does show that we as an organization take this very seriously and, and do act upon in any case. And that builds trust on one side. So people trust more that they can come forward and talk to us confidentially. But it, I believe it also will give a very clear message on prevention. It actually means in this organization, we have rules. And if things come up, we will look into them professionally, quickly, swiftly, and we will take action if we can substantiate the complaint. And that definitely, as I was saying before, this is a bit the police officer who is implementing traffic rules. If nobody is ever telling you that you've just uh, passed the red light, you know, you'll continue doing that uh, all the time. Whereas if there is a policeman standing there and giving you a, a big fine or taking your um, driving license away from you, that's much more efficient as a deterrent. And if you make that publicly known, it also gives a message to other staff and other people who are working for us. Thank you very much, Shell. I can see uh, there is a lot of comments online and quite a few questions. So I'm sorry, we cannot reply to individual complaints or dissatisfaction or examples you're giving because that's just, first of all, not enough time. And second, it's difficult to make any comments on complaints or situations without having um, more detailed information. So uh, I'll, I'll not get back to those uh, individual cases and human rights abuses, which is maybe a, a different topic than the one we, we speak about today. Thank you, Shell, very much. Good. Let me, uh, any questions to Shell and or to Smoothie specific questions? While you do that, I just, if we can go back to the presentation, maybe um, uh, Kuram, I just wanted to tell you um, to end this presentation, okay, there is prevention uh, in the sense of communicating better, uh, giving clear messages, explaining what we mean by what we do. There is prevention in terms of robust investigations. So clear guidance on investigations, uh, clear systems, how we do that disciplinary action if needed. And there is one thing which I also want to just quickly mention is the misconduct disclosure scheme, which is also a tool meant to improve prevention of sexual exploitation and abuse. This scheme is hosted by the uh, Steering Committee for Humanitarian Response. And unfortunately, Garrett was not able to be with us today. So I'm, I'm just quickly uh, presenting that scheme to all of you. Um, and you can then get back to them to get more information if you'd like to. So this scheme is co consists of two main commitments. On one side, it's the commitment to systematically check with previous employers when we do employ new people. If there was any issue related to SEA or children, then we have potential new hires. That's the, com the commitment in that sense. And there is also the commitment on the other side to respond systematically when we receive such checks from others. It's not been always done in the past. And this is about systematic checking and vetting when we will employ new people. The scheme is not a centralized database. So it's not collecting information on individual cases or on individual people. So not to be worried about data protection or something like that. It's not Big Brother watch, watching us, but it's facilitating relations between potential employers and former employers um, so that uh, they can share misconduct data if there was any data to be shared on, on a new hire. It really should support organizations to have more information, better information, and make a better hiring decision to find, to see who is appropriate, for example, to work for children or to work in communities or to work with very vulnerable adults. Can you move uh, to the next one, Huram? 
please. Good, so that's how it looks like. So just to say, so that is, that is the request, how it gets in. It's a confidential statement, of course, and it asks, has there been ever any issues with that person? Yes or no? And if yes, what can you share? This then allows the organization to ask uh, more focused questions to the candidate if they still want to go ahead with the, with the recruitment. You can move to the next one. So figures are pretty boring, we all agree, but sometimes it's still interesting to look at the impact of, of, of something and measure uh, figures. We've seen, for example, reporting figures or Shell has just told us that they were not enough compliance and now ha has increased. So that that tells us something on the impact of, of a system. And in this case as well, so the system, the misconduct uh, scheme only exists since the beginning of 2019. And in the first year, it has impacted over 3,700 recruitments. That is probably not so much if we, we think about the hundreds of thousands of recruitments probably happening every year in that sector. But still, um, uh, more than 2,000 uh, um, cases have been exchanged and provided. And this not only from signatories to the misconduct scheme, but also from organizations who have actually not signed up to the scheme or not yet signed up to the scheme. You can move Khuram to the next one. Sorry, so it has moved from 14 to 58 organizations uh, as by October, 2020. Uh, most of these organizations are actually international NGOs, big international NGOs. So uh, not, much, not much progress has been made on local implementing uh, organizations. However, the ones who have signed up have reported that it has really helped them improving the systematization of both requesting checks and responding to checks. And uh, we'll see how that develops um, over the next couple of months. There is a number of new kind of international organizations joining the scheme. So donors, some UN bodies, and also people from the private sector because we all recognize that this is not just a problem of the humanitarian sector. The power, the power differential is actually um, also, um, we also find these issues in the private sector. So they're very welcome to join uh, the same effort. Uh, can we move to the next one? Now, what is interesting, again, this is not a very high number, but still the scheme has resulted in 36 applicants being rejected at the final stage of the recruitment, either because there was negative data or there was no data. So the, the, the organization who was contacted did refuse to reply on the request. This, even though the number is low, but it actually means that people who maybe should uh, work in a different sector with less vulnerable people are still applying for jobs in, in, in large high profile humanitarian organizations. Although we do a lot of safeguarding, we have put up a lot of barriers. So people do still apply for these jobs and, and it shows the need of better vetting and better reference checks um, to somehow have a, have a barrier. And maybe you can move to the last one, Huram. Good. I'm sharing the contacts from uh, the uh, Steering Committee of Humanitarian Response. They're very happy to give you more information on the scheme, uh, tell you how it works, how uh, organizations can sign up, what is expected, what is your obligations once you're signing up for this, um, for this scheme. It's just another tool which should help us prevent um, same as the, the, the investigations Shell has told us about and same as improved communication. Good, thank you. So now the floor is yours. We have a, a, another 10 minutes left. So anybody from the audience would like to share something with us? Okay, uh, somebody is asking, I want to take that question in, in, in direct reference checking. Does it mean that the candidate who had experience in violation of SCA won't be dismissed from potential job? She applied. I'm not sure I'm 100% understanding the mm -hmm. question, but 
somebody who has, and Shelly will confirm that with me, if an investigation demonstrates that somebody has violated uh, sexual exploitation and abuse uh, commitment, most of the organizations have quite a clear um, zero tolerance policy about that. And it would mean that the person is dismissed in most of the cases, I suppose. Shell, maybe you want to reply on that one. Uh, no, I, I agree with that. If there are clear uh, breaches of, uh, of the rules and regulations, they are normally dismissed, uh, unless there are some factors that, uh, yeah, it depends on the seriousness of it, but uh, the, what we have is, if it's not dismissed, it's a it's a written warning, and they might be uh, given a new uh, position in the organization, uh, etc. Uh, but there are some kind of reaction. But normally, if there's a breach, there's a dismissal. Okay, thank you. And and we know that there are some countries where dismissal is maybe more difficult. Um, like in France, it's quite quite tough to dismiss somebody um, even in, in, in these cases. But so there can be contextualized um, differences, but the global idea is some, we all say that we have a zero tolerance. So one of these actions which is expected from us actually when we say we have to walk the talk is that there needs to be a reaction and there needs to be disciplinary action which can include dismissal. Uh, it then means the misconduct scheme would mean that if this person then goes to another organization from NCA to, I don't know, um, Save the Children, and NCA receives a request, if NCA is a signature to the scheme, they would say we had an issue and this person was dismissed on grounds of an NCA investigation. Again, there might be some local, some national laws which prohibit to give that kind of information, but to the extent of what is possible, the scheme should facilitate that kind of exchange. Good. Any other? Um... I just uh, some some of the comments that I'm seeing in the chat uh, about it is the state's responsibility uh, to address safeguarding issue occurring in this in in the society. I think here. We need to distinguish between what is our responsibility as an organization, um, because you are working in specific situation. You are there, you have a mandate to work there um, as an organization and your community that you work with should uh, rely that you are working in, in a safe way. So I think um, organizations have a responsibility to make sure that they deal with the issues um, when their staff are, are uh, the one abusing. There's, there, there's no excuse for not um, actually dealing with that. It's really your responsibility. You cannot leave it to the others because they don't know your rules and regulations. They don't know your code of conduct. Um, so I think that there are these, yeah, new responsibilities. Of course, if they breach the law, then they need to be taken uh, also um, by law to, 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 I don't know, jurisdiction or whatever. But I think the, um, the organization has a huge responsibility because it sends the wrong signal if you don't deal with it, because then the other staff may think they can get away with it as well. And this is, I think, an issue of communication, right? Very clear communication about what is expected of the, of the staff that work for you you are the employer. I think that has a huge um, weight to it and, and we need to make sure we act on it. Thanks. Thank you, Smuti. I can see also there is a question on the safeguarding mechanism, including interagency initiatives. There are actually quite a few interagency initiatives, which you will need to uh, find out on your own regional level, but there are such initiatives in, for example, Ethiopia, in Uganda, in Myanmar, um, in different, in different places. Again, with the same idea, maybe to create common complaint systems in some cases, which is a really, really helpful tool for the committees to make it easier to complain. Sometimes it is to support each other on investigations because we realize that it's a really difficult subject and we don't, all of us have the right expertise to handle such uh, 
um, investigation, I see some questions how you would ensure respect to everybody, etc. So yes, that's a whole different topics. We can again speak for one week about investigations. But yes, investigations need to be done by professionally trained people, and we don't always have the expertise. So interagency initiatives in that in that sense are really important. They can also be really helpful on thinking through this famous communication with communities uh, in a contextualized way, instead of each of us thinking how we should communicate to a community in Pakistan or in Afghanistan, maybe if we put our efforts together in an interagency initiative, we can actually share what we have already worked on so that others can, can use a similar tool if they work in the same community. I don't think we can copy and paste from South America to Asia, mm. but we definitely can do some copy and pasting and sharing when we all work in Myanmar or when we all work in um, Tigray or Yemen or wherever we, we work. I think there was another important um, comment and I want to take that up maybe to then close the webinar for today. Uh, somebody has been uh, suggesting in the chat, chat that the name of any abuser must be shared with organizations nationally and internationally, just to remind ourselves that even the abuser has rights and that mm. would actually violate his or her rights in most of the countries. So this is again, not maybe about uh, throwing somebody out there. It's to ensure that this person cannot do any harm anymore. We're not the police, we're not the law, uh, we're not putting people in, in jail. We want to ensure that our own organizations are safe from potential abusers. But in most of the counties, this would be actually illegal to share a name publicly, internationally and nationally. Um, and not to forget that we, um, when, when, <laughs> when we investigate cases, we are just us, so we can get it wrong, actually. We can make a mistake. And even if we substantiate a claim, we need to remain quite humble, I think. And, think sometimes maybe we haven't seen the full picture. So it would be not a fair process to kind of publicize a name of somebody publicly unless, um, you know, sometimes it gets into the news. That's a different, a different topic. Yeah. Yes, I can see. Yeah, I wanted to, yeah, <laughs> I just wanted <laughs> to emphasize something. Um, you, you just earlier, you talked about the interagency mechanisms, right? Uh, what I see is in many countries, uh, these are existing, but actually local and national actors are not in that conversation. And I would really encourage you to take part. I mean, I'm giving you a practical example from Myanmar. Um, you know, when I first went three years ago there, uh, there, was no, there was only one organization taking part. And they had no idea that all these messages and translated messages were being created and all of that. So, you know, I really encourage you to, to take part in these um, interagency meetings so that you find out and work together with them on how to localize these messages. Uh, because it's a, also a way of getting support um, and working together uh, regionally, but also locally in, your, in, in the locations that you work. Um, because often, unless we pool our resources, it's going to be very hard to work on, on this totally on our own. So I really want to encourage you to, to take part in some of these uh, things, find out who are the focal points and demand to your place at the table. Because if you don't do that, uh, they, these resources are for you as well as the international organizations, right? So be at the table and make your voice count. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks, Smuti, to remind us of that. Good. So here we are. Thank you very much. That was a very short one and a half an hour, as usual. Thank you. Uh, I will hand over to, um, to um, Huram in just one minute. I want to really thank you, Smuti, for your very valuable uh, in input into this um, webinar. And thank you very much, Shell, both of you. Uh, how, of having gotten up so early to join us uh, for this one and a half an hour. Thanks a lot. Um, and I want also to thank um, Community World Services Asia of having hosted us. And I will give back to Huram to close and Palvasha Pat to close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Esther. 
um, for facilitating this session. And uh, thank you to the rest of the speakers, Smoothie and Sel, for um, also for participating and sharing such important information with all of us here today. Uh, and waking up so early in the morning for all of us, uh, I know it's difficult, but we really, really appreciate your time and commitment to this important issue. Um, uh, as you can see um, on the screen, you, there's another poll. Uh, so please take two minutes to just answer these questions um, so that uh, we get um, some sort of an idea of how you, um, what your experience was of the session today. Um, we, we, we're also uh, sharing uh, some of our upcoming webinars uh, as part of the 2020 Regional uh, Humanitarian Partnership events, uh, which we're co-hosting with ADRRN, um, ICWA, and UN Acha. So um, there are more events coming up, but which might be of interest to you. So you can um, log on to our website and you can um, uh, get more information on these events. There's one on November 30th, then on December 2nd and December 14th. Thank you to all the participants who joined us from all over the world. Uh, thank you for your, um, for your inputs uh, during um, the session in the chat groups and in the question and answer box. So thank you all and um, have a good day. And again, thank you so much, Esther. Um, my pleasure. Have a good rest of the day. Bye bye to everybody. Thank you. I just want to remind 30th of November, we have this um, A4EP webinar on coordination and representation. Please join us. How yes. do we send you the information? Yes, this is coordination representation. Uh, who is making these decisions? And I'm sure you enjoyed. Uh, Smruti's uh, talk and so the, there'll be a lot more of Smruti there. So for those of you interested, please join. This will be a great session. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.